The demon comes out when you expel it. The stronghold comes down when you demolish it with the Bible. Yes, folks, that's a guy in it's a guy in Tennessee smashing a Barbie playhouse because it's <laughs> too feminist and woke. Of course, that requires no elaboration. I'm Matt Leck with me, David Griscom. Hello, David. Hey brother, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. And uh, just in a little moment, we're gonna be lo- joined by Bronco March Teach to um to shill for the squad a little bit. Um <laughs> and uh, talk about, I mean, frankly, a tension that we've been discussing a lot <laughs> on this show uh for the past, I mean, while now. Um and uh, Bronco's done a really great piece in Jacobin uh reporting on uh the actual accomplishments that we need to reckon with um before we uh, jump too far into uh damning the squad as a bunch of neolib uh uh shills so uh yeah. looking forward to that um before that though david what do we got yeah well um later in the show don't uh, forget that we are going to be talking about the teamsters um who uh, voted by 86 percent um to um ratify this new contract with ups we'll be talking a little bit more in depth about that later and don't forget, folks, if you want to um, support the show, see more of the stuff that we're doing, support's over there at patreon.com slash left reckoning. Um, and uh, you get access to post game, our bonus episodes. And we're going to be doing our Mark's uh, reading series with special guests. Uh, our good friend Arm Brown will be joining us to read the Communist Manifesto, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so if you want access to that, just five bucks a month, patreon.com slash left reckoning. We appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Um, and uh, just one quick note to my co-host, Matt, um, after this segment, before we bring Bronco on, there is a sp- thing that we need to plug. Um, That's correct. OK, so just remember that. Um, yep. Anyways, folks, let's get to this story. And we got a lot of uh, you know good news, particularly with the Teamsters to get to today. Um, but we have to start um, with a, a little bit of a difficult story that I think is important to be highlighting on this program. I know a lot of people have been messaging me about this over the summer. A lot of folks have been trying to uh, get more attention to it, um, but it has certainly not gotten enough attention. Um, And what is that? It's still hot as hell here in Texas. And we've talked a lot about the war on workers in the state, notably HB 2127, which effectively bars local governments from implementing policies like water breaks uh, to give workers relief. And why is this important? It's because the heat can be a killer. And Texas, um, along with this war on workers, is one of 13 states in the country that does not have universal prison air conditioning. About 70% of units in Texas prisons have no or only partial cooling. Prisoners in Texas are baking. Since the beginning of this godforsaken heat wave, 41 prisoners, I want to say that again, 41 prisoners in the state of Texas have died from heart-related or unknown causes, according to the Texas Tribune. This is notable Um, Because a lot of those people who are passing away from, quote unquote, heart related issues are young people in their 20s and in their 30s. And just like when we talk about workers on the job sites um, who are being whose deaths are being sort of chalked up uh, to heart issues or other comorbidities, uh, more often than not, when you're chalking it up to that, it probably means that this person was exposed to tremendous amounts of heat. And there's a whole host of criticisms from a lot of advocacy organizations about the way that the state is reporting deaths um, and even from a lot of family members who think that the state is not telling the truth about the conditions and the causes of people, uh, people's uh, passing in, in these prisons. Um, and there has just not been enough outcry um, for these conditions that prisoners are facing. Um, I wanted to highlight some of the words um, of, of some prisoners here. Uh, this is from KUT. Um, KUT, our MPA, NPR system, uh, station here, 90.5. Um, Why didn't they just kill us is the name of the article. Three women talk about life in a Texas prison without AC. Uh, these are three women who were interviewed by KUT um, who are being held um, at the hobby unit um, here in Texas. Uh, the sink water is brown when it comes out of the faucet. I know that that maintenance puts bleach tablets in our water at times to kind of control how it looks. 
I'm not quite sure what I'm drinking. I can tell you some days are better than others. One of the biggest issues that I have is officers treating us as though water is a privilege. The officers are supposed to let us out every hour for cold water, but the officers are not doing their job making sure that we get cold water. We're in here. This is another prisoner. We're in here during the hottest parts of the day. There will be times I can't put my back on the concrete wall because it's so hot. The toilets we sit on are stainless steel. When we sit on those, sometimes the back of the toilet will burn your back because it's so hot. Um, and lastly, um, one of them said, I just want people to remember that while I made a mistake, I'm still somebody's daughter and somebody's yeah. sister. I feel like anybody could be sitting where I'm at. I made a choice. I made a decision. It was a bad one. But I'm you, just one decision away. Remember that we're humans. I did commit a crime. I'm still being punished. But this is torture. If that's what they wanted to do, why didn't they just kill us? And th there is just tremendous inhumanity um, in, in these decisions. It's a, it's a shame on the state. It's the state on our leadership. It's a shame on this government. Um, and all the while, while this is happening, if it's not shameful enough, there are plenty of people who are making a buck. Uh, just to name one of them, uh, Texas Public Radio also reported that the price of bottled water has gone up 50% in prison commissaries this summer. Quote, commissary vendor Royal Pacific Tea Company requested to raise the prices in March, even though its contract was incomplete. So as people are suffering under this heat wave all across the state, at job, state, job sites across the state and in our prisons here in Texas, Royal Pacific Tea Company is making a buck with the approval of the state comptroller and Texas Department of Criminal Justice. It's truly just an inhumane um, thing to be putting these people in these conditions one of the you know you could li you should listen to the entirety of of these interviews why didn't they just kill us three women talk about life in a texas prison without um ac um put out by kut um it's really harrowing um you know they note um that one of them describes it like the only way to describe what it's like in their cell is if you remember when you're a kid and you're outside playing on the road or in the concrete in the summer and you know how hot it is if you're not wearing shoes or something like that well, they say, imagine um, if you just took that, folded it into a box and put yourself inside of it. That is what my daily life is like. Noting that a lot of prison guards are basically uh, playing fast and loose with rules when it comes to water is sickening. Um, prisoners are supposed to be able to get a respite shower um, if they request it, which means that they're allowed to go and basically pour cold water on themselves in the shower so that they can cool down. Because as I noted earlier, 70% of the units in the state of Texas do not have air conditioning, which is a life and death issue for everyone in this state. Um, recently, the U.S. House Committee on Oversight and Accountability implored Republican James Comer to launch an investigation into conditions at prisons enduring sweltering temperatures, especially in Texas. The request follows the Republican committee uh, members' investigation into conditions for defendants jailed on charges related to the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. And that's a quote uh, from the Texas Tribune. Um, so this is just a basic humanitarian crisis. This is torture. Um, to strip people of their rights, to deny them water, to make them bake in a cell where people are talking, um, you know, it, it as you know, not to bring it up again, but that quote there should sit with you. Why didn't they just kill us is what somebody's saying about the conditions that they're under. Another note um, that one of the prisoners made is that like even dogs in the pound have to have air conditioning. And what kind of message does that say for how we think about human life in the state of Texas um, when we treat animals and dogs better than we do human beings? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely revolting. It's disgusting. It's just it's 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 so clear, too, as this heat has continued to be a killer and a devastating force in the state, um, you know, that that. That they basically, the, the GOP here, um, thinks that these people don't matter, that they don't exist, and that they can sweep this under the rug. And also remember that this isn't just that they're forgetting about these people. There are people making money off of this. And that mm -hmm. is like adds to the sickness of it, right? Hey, water's expensive. Water's very expensive, right? I mean, it's disgusting. It's and anybody that, anybody that would withhold water like that um, would kill. Like they just haven't been asked yet. And there's basically seen how close can we get to it being still considered negligence if you people die in these conditions. 
One hundred percent. It's a shame on the state. So um, yeah. I hope everybody, you know, can, can continue to raise awareness about this, spread the word, and you know, support these efforts to shine some light. The, the U.S. government, the federal government, should absolutely investigate prison conditions in the state. Um, this is just part of the reporting that we've heard about the abhorrent conditions that people are suffering under here. And remember, you know, that there's a whole spectrum of people who become incarcerated from people who commit crimes like murder, uh, the people who might be incarcerated because of more petty pedestrian things. And they're all put under these same conditions. Don't forget that San what happened to Sandra Bland um, in the state of Texas and many, many, many others who have been abused by the system. You are not as far away from these things as you might think is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I know that's a tough one um, to to jump from, so we're just going to have to do it, folks. Uh, we have a really exciting interview coming up in just a second. Um, but before we do, uh, we want to remind folks of another program that they should be checking out. Um, Matt, I don't know if you have that prepped and ready to go. Yes. I want to tell you about a podcast called Best of the Left. And I don't just want to tell you about it because it has featured uh, this program uh, in it as it ha did an episode uh, 1484, Elon Musk is not your savior and he is actually awful. Uh, best of the left, uh, I discovered them actually um, before I was ever a professional uh, podcaster in this business. And it's how I found out about the Majority Report or first listened to the Majority Report in podcast form. They clipped um, Majority Report segments and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other ones, too, um, from around the sort of like progressive left uh, media sphere. Uh, I was a big fair fan they didn't ask us to clip uh, you know our segment you know must they just take it i'm a big fan of that sort of free uh culture uh basically what they do is they uh take all these they make compilations of commentary on specific topics like i said about the uh elon musk stuff um and a whole bunch of different other topics and uh uh yeah as a way to uh con as i put it uh in this uh, copy that i prepared as a way to convey and reiterate information uh, and also as a way to con cultivate an independent left media. Uh, I'm generally a prou a proud to have appeared in segments, pulled for their shows. And uh, yeah, I recommend the podcast. So uh, check that out. Best of the left. I'll just put the website up very briefly here. People can see uh, we were given the uh, closer spot with our sec uh, yeah. clip. Elon segregationist and culture war in Colorado with Chase Woodruff. So. Yeah, so folks should definitely yeah. check it out and appreciate them. Um, well, should we get to our guest this evening? Yeah, let me just say the uh, I probably say the um, oh, yes, please. H sorry. Yeah, www.bestoftheleft.com. There you go, folks. You'll find it on all your podcast uh, apps. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt and I are professionals, y'all. Um, <laughs> we do ads. I, I'm very. What's that guy that does the sham wow? <laughs> um, yeah. He like, got in trouble yeah, later, they, actually. And this is actually a product I have intimate knowledge with. Oh, he'd get in trouble. Damn. Well, see, you can't trust anybody these days. Who can you trust besides mercenaries for brands? But no, this is best of the left. You check it out. Um, yeah. So let's bring on um, someone else from a publication that we like very much, Jacobin Magazine. Uh, we are joined by Bronco Marsha Teach, who is a writer who I respect immensely. Whenever I see that byline, I know I'm going to read his piece. Uh, Bronco, how are you doing, brother? Hey, great. How are you guys going? Doing good. Not too bad, man. Um, really excited to have you on, which, uh, you know, have this conversation, which I'm sure everyone's going to react to very normally. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, this actually, like, I think this gets us into maybe setting this up um, because there's something I'm sure you know this um, on, on your side in print, um, but in digital media, in YouTube podcasts, if you put AOC um, in your title, it's going to do some numbers, right? <laughs> There's just like a constant appetite uh, for conversations pro or against uh, this this group of people. And I'm curious, uh, before we start to get into like the nitty gritty of, of your argument and what you outlined in your piece, like maybe what's some of the inspiration for feeling that, you know, right now and, you know, in August, uh, right now is the time to sort of you know, put a compilation of the things that they've been able to achieve while in elected office. I mean, what was the inspiration here? I mean, I think we've all seen for a while, there's been this kind of very over the top and hyperbolic, um, you know, uh, condemnation uh, of AOC and the squad that kind of, it's, it's often very one dimensional. It's it kind of, you know, focuses excessively, uh, or at least focuses exclusively on 
you know, the place that they fall short, which are very real and legitimate, and then completely ignores everything else, you know. Mm. Um, and and I, I think there's a re- variety of reasons why that uh, happens, but but it's existed for a while now. And there was um, uh, a piece in New York Magazine by, by Frieda, Frieda Boer, who, um, you know, normally I actually quite like his pieces. I didn't, uh, didn't agree with this one. Um, I thought... It, it just uh, it, it was lacking uh, uh, certain things. You know, I, I speak to activists uh, who, who work and you know uh, collaborate with the squad uh, on a variety of issues, you know, foreign policy and other issues. And and I know that there's a little more to the story than is usually presented. So I thought you know it would be good to maybe just balance out some of the the vitriolic. Um, uh, uh, nature of the the coverage of uh, these these people in Congress and and actually you know have a think about you know what what is the actual value of having left wing members in Congress what what do they actually bring to the table is it is it just a matter of sort of compiling all their bad and good votes and then minusing one from the other and and, and seeing uh, what number comes out or is there actually something more kind of uh, fundamental is there, is there something actually that the a role they play for people who are engaged in movements on the ground. That was sort of the, the, the thinking I went into the piece with. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to like jump into to some of these things because like I, I will just be honest and lay our cars out on the table, um, particularly on like the, the railroad um, vote. Um, I was extremely disappointed. I found that to be a really devastating uh, moment uh, for for the left. And like I always have this kind of you know, tension whenever we're reporting on this kind of stuff, because like I am very frustrated with the state of play of of U.S. politics right now. Um, But one thing that does frustrate me is that like I almost feel like when you do these criticisms, it's like pushing on an open door. And what I mean by that is that like I feel like sometimes people who don't really follow politics closely Right. And like, fair enough. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in our lives might miss some of these other things that are happening um, that are like positives. Right. So like you see these big things that are really devastating. Yes, I agree um, that they're that they're devastating and problematic. And I don't know if you, if you agree with that or not. But, um, you know, people also miss all of the other stuff that's might not be getting on the front page of things. But before we jump into all of this, I do want to focus on one specific thing that I know you're going to get criticized for, and I think is extremely unfair, uh, which is uh, their position on Ukraine. You have been a very outspoken person about some of the pro-war sentiments of the Democratic Party a- a- as a whole, and even some of your disappointment with these members of, of the squad. I mean, you get attacked constantly online for your position on this kind of thing. So I just want to front load that for anyone who's less familiar with your work, that you can't come at this guy for not having a principal take on Ukraine. Oh, no. Well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to criticize about about the, the squads, you know, and not just the squad. I mean, I, I think, you know, I've been particularly disappointed with Sanders. I think he mm-hmm. uh, uh put out a very smart and reasonable and sensible op-ed in The Guardian just before war started, basically saying, yes, obviously, you know, Russia, the Russian government is bad in innumerable ways and, and anything they do, if they invade this country, it'll be criminal and, and, and terrible and, and, and everything. But also we have to understand, uh, you know, the, the relationship of, of NATO expansion and how that kind of elicits uh, or help to elicit that kind of response. And we have to look at, you know, use a little bit of strategic empathy and put ourselves in, 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 in Russia's shoes. Well, what happened if Russia or China had a military alliance with Mexico, for instance, so on and so forth, right? So it was a pretty good uh, op-ed. Since then, you know, he's really gone quiet. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, you look at Sam's career, it, it, you know, it very much tracks with how he operates. He's very strategic around what issues he decides to be publicly outspoken on. And obviously right now the political climate, the kind of discourse is absolutely crazy. And clearly he's decided that it's not worth it. But I think, you know, um, uh, you can support arming Ukraine. You can support sending all these uh, uh, weapons and and, and military aid to the country. You can still be uh, in favor of negotiations. A lot of people, in fact, have, you know, in, in the sort of intellectual space. Um, you can also, you know, support Ukraine's uh, uh, right to self-defense while warning about the profound dangers of nuclear war. 
Uh, and he hasn't done either of those. And, you know, I think some of the squad also have, have fallen short on that. I think that's where I'm most disappointed. Um, I think, you know, whether you want to argue about the, the military are going there or not, the fact is in U.S., and not just the U.S., but, you know, U.S. and European, and I would, I would say even just Western political discourse, yeah. it's the, the idea that of, of, of not sending military weapons is simply a non-negotiable thing. It's not a thing that it, it's kind of became a, a beyond-the-pale idea. So you can understand why politicians will be cautious on that front. But what I think is completely indefensible is to not talk about, you know, the need to, to, to enter peace talks, the need to wind down the war. So I think that's that's kind of my criticism of that. And I have to say, though, I mean, you know, we have to we have to uh, uh, acknowledge the good and the bad. Yes, uh, the squad has voted for all these military aid packages. But by the way, Ocasio-Cortez um, uh, was one of the few the very few signers of that diplomatic letter back in uh, October. And and at this point, God, when you look at the bloody yeah. uh, death toll uh, that, 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 you know, not just, uh, I mean, in just Ukraine, but also, you know, the, the Russia as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's a monstrous death toll. Um, all those lives could have been lost if we had just, uh, could have been saved, I'm sorry, if we had just listened to them. But she was one of the few people that stood by that letter. Most people basically, uh, tucked their tail between their legs uh, in the wake of that that backlash and said, you know, this is completely wrong. I'm so sorry that we ever suggested that the war should end. So, you know, let's let's give a little bit of credit. You know, um, I think that's that's part of the problem with this this discourse around the squad. It's it's very kind of unbalanced. And, mm-hmm. uh, no, I mean, and I think that that's a, that's a very fair point. So, I mean, like, you know, let, let's start us off and maybe we can start domestically. I mean, um, you went through, uh, won both uh, some of the votes that AOC and members of the squad have taken, um, but also some of their relationships uh, with people in the labor movement, with people in the like NGO sector. I mean, could you give people a, a kind of general sense of some of the things that you sort of talked about in your piece um, that might be either surprising or unnoted by most people um, when it comes to the record here? Sure. I mean, you know, Sarah Nelson, for instance, uh, the, the president of the Fight Attendance, Union, Fight Attendance Union, she said to me, you know, AOC was one of the few people that came to her office when she was elected and, and, and wanted to hear from her. I think I uh, was there for two hours talking to her about what she wanted, what her priorities were, you know, uh, and, and they've stayed in touch, apparently, you know, uh, the, her office. And and the FAA, they work uh, with, not the FAA, but, you know, they work with the... Uh, 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 work together on 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 the reauthorization of, of, of the FAA, so uh, to, to try and get the union's uh, priorities into the bill. Um, I mean, uh, there were there was a housing justice for all uh, activist I spoke to who, who spoke about the importance of AOC and other squad members, but particularly AOC, and in, in pushing some of their uh, uh, priorities at the state level. Um, because I mean, you know, we. It's not as satisfying to talk about because these are often intangible things, mm-hmm. but uh, there is a value in the kind of platform that, that people like AOC have, where they're able to bring um, uh, attention to, to issues and legislation that otherwise might not get as much public support or popular pressure behind it. Um, and I mean, that's one of the biggest things uh, that, that, that people point out to me. You know, I think people also said to me that that what they appreciated was was uh, that that people were inspired by by the squad you know whatever criticism we might have is people who are deeply uh politically engaged and and, and you know uh spend our entire days reading the news and and sort of you know uh, having intense detailed uh, uh uh arguments about everything that's happening i mean there's a lot of people who are politically disengaged who uh maybe don't know that much about you know uh, what, what's going on or, or perhaps are interested in but but find it daunting and and they have been inspired by the squad to to get involved um you know whether it's it's to get involved in, in activist work whether to join a union and start organizing um i think that's that's another intangible thing um i mean but also i mean if we're just talking about domestic stuff i mean you know uh think about the green new deal uh, mm-hmm. again people will say oh well you know this is this bill went nowhere and then even passed in the house uh so what was you know what did it really do but i i find it a little a uh, bit of a stretch to say that that if uh that, that you know we would have seen some of the movement as as 
uh, inadequate and flawed as it has been under the Biden administration, but I, I find it hard to believe that we would have seen that movement happening um, on climate without AOC first, you know, bringing the massive amount of publicity and energy behind the Green New Deal and sort of putting forward a, a marker for what the, uh, not just what the, the left's response to climate change is, but really what the the national response uh, uh, period should be. Um, and that bill, even though it didn't pass, I think it had a tremendous effect on, on the conversation. I think it, it inspired, I mean, it definitely inspired bills at the state and local mm -hmm. levels all around the country. I mean, it's even inspired, you know, similar efforts in other countries. I mean, uh, the UK, for instance, um, you know, very much modeled some of the, the stuff it did on climate on that uh, resolution. I can tell you also, you know, when I visit New Zealand, uh, there's similar organizing starting to happen there um, based on based on that. I mean, I'm, you know, it wouldn't be just those two countries, but those are just two examples. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a pretty, it's a pretty good list. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing something out, but people can always read through them. You know, and, and one thing that you noted in, in the piece um, was particularly like on the Green New Deal was AOC's like willingness to like hear criticism or like parts of, the, of, of that bill where people felt it didn't go far enough um, too, which I think is something that's really important to note as well. Um, is that there is a, a, a connection. And I think towards the end, we can maybe go into some of like what the squad is and maybe some of the other problems there. But I think that's a very, very positive thing that, again, like people might not, if you're just sort of engaging with politics in the sense of like being a viewer, right, of just like mm -hmm. following the news or just seeing what happens on Twitter, you might not know about these kind of conversations that are happening that are steering them in, in a certain direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's important that there are people in Congress who are actually responsive to the left, um, because a lot of lawmakers uh, are not. And I mean, you know, the, the I think a lot of people read a piece like this, or they see a piece like this, and I think their knee-jerk kind of reaction is they, they think, oh, this is a piece about how criticizing the squad is bad or criticizing these, you know, anyone on the left who has been elected to office is bad. That's not at all. Uh, it's actually very important to criticize these people. It's very important mm -hmm. to put pressure on them. Um, we want to have them obviously be accountable uh, to, to movements on the ground and to, to, to you know, left-wing organizations. Um, but, uh, you know, we also have to kind of put it into perspective. I mean, I think it's a good sign that even when uh, the squad has fallen short, they have, uh, I'm not saying it's in every case, but but in key cases, including the Green New Deal resolution, including uh, on certain things in, in Israel, the, the squad has shown that it is kind of responsive to to pressure and criticism of the left. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, if you care about the actual practice of, of translating, you know, socialist ideas into, into, into uh, tangible realities, um, you know, it's, it's, it is good to have people who are conduits for that in power. And I think it's, it's important for us to keep that in mind rather than kind of devolve into this very pessimistic kind of, I, I think it's a very despairing outlook. Oh, look, these people are completely, this is all a big waste of time. Why do we even do this? Let's just forget about all of it. Let's just go back to being a talking shop and a, and a sort of social club, you know, uh, that, that doesn't have any impact on anything. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I definitely really want to jump in <laughs> into that more with you, and I'm sorry for keep evading that. But before before we get more into that, I did want to sort of turn a little bit to foreign policy, and we've sort of laid out the Ukraine uh, criticism and, and disappointment here. But there's a lot I think that folks miss. I mean, could you sort of talk about you know the relationship here with South America and Latin America? Two things. Um, two, uh, two things. A part of the world is very important to me. It's a big, it was something that was very important to Michael. Um, it's something that the left should be caring about, should be very involved in. And it is sort of funny to me how certain things get really buzzy um, and get covered a lot. People have strong pins on, but then literally our neighbors, there's a lot of ignorance about what's what's happening there. I mean, those, uh, particularly when it comes to the Americas, uh, the squad has been fairly effective um, in pushing back against U.S. aggression, right? Yeah, I mean, look, Ukraine is, is and, and the war going on there is is arguably the, the most important and dangerous conflict in the world, um, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but it is not the only uh, uh, thing going on in the world. It's not the only foreign policy issue in question in U.S. politics. Of course, the United States relationship with governments in Latin America is is a hugely important uh, question. I mean, the, the U.S. Mm -hmm. has 
a very long history of uh, stamping out left-wing movements in the region, of uh, overthrowing and undermining governments, um, or, you know, simply giving cover and support to really repressive governments. Um, and, and the squad uh, has played an important role in pushing back against some of that stuff. I mean, one very good example is uh, AOC, I think after Ilhan Omar, was the uh, second congressperson. Um, and, and probably at this point, you know, probably one of like 10, if, if even that, to, to call what happened in Bolivia in 2019 a coup. I think people don't realize that in, in the U.S. Congress, that is, even after everything that happened on January 6th, which is identical, to what they did in Bolivia, even after what we saw in Brazil, which I think most of at least the Democratic side uh, acknowledges that was a coup attempt, um, uh, uh, people don't see the Bolivian example as a coup, and and they they were very early out the gate saying this is what's happening there as a coup is wrong. Um, now you know again you might say well this is just you know it's, it's symbolic it's just rhetoric it's just a tweet what have you. Um, but I can guarantee you that if the squad did not say that, if AOC and Omar and Sanders and, and the others mm -hmm. had not said that, do we really think that the people who are you know so quick to jump on every bad thing they do would not be denouncing them for that? Of course they would be. And so I think that that points to the importance uh, uh, of stuff like this. Um, I mean, uh, just to give a few more examples, uh, AOC at the same time also managed to get a... a um, uh, uh, an amendment passed through the House uh, banning uh, uh, military aid and, and crowd control equipment to Bolivia in the mm -hmm. wake of the coup. Uh, she's done similar things um, in, in uh, for Peru, and uh, you know, uh, after the removal of its president, its leftist president, and, and uh, the crackdown on anti-government protests that followed, um, she's uh, introduced amendments uh, that, that supported. What uh, Colombia's leftist prison is doing, trying to you know uh, uh, end uh, anti-narcotic fumigation that's causing health effects, and that stuff is appreciated by people in the region. I mean, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's a great quote from from uh, Eric Spelling, one of the people I, I, I talked to for this, where he says, you know, maybe maybe for the people who are just sitting in the United States or somewhere in Europe, posting about how you know these these people are sellouts, that doesn't matter, but it actually does matter uh, down there because it it, it signals to um, you know, either, either the people's movements in these areas or uh, to repressive governments that, hey, we're actually keeping an eye on what's happening. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you if you push things too far, if you if you do something bad, I mean, um, they're, they're, the U.S. might actually take some steps to hold you accountable. Yeah, and I, I will just say, um, you know, it's it's very noted, particularly the the interventions on Bolivia, which are very important. And I will just say selfishly, I wish a lot of other left media would pay more attention to Bolivia. And also, if there might be a little bit of a reckoning for a lot of people who consider themselves to be progressives who were yeah. saying some pretty nasty things about Evo Morales when the coup started. But they were supporting the Jan wars. 6. <laughs> <laughs> Those are flame wars we don't have to draw you into, friend. Um, before we talk more generally about um, about them, I, I did want to, you know, there is another kind of elephant in the room when it comes to foreign policy, and that's Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, AOC famously, um, you know, started out pretty strong on the issue um, and then made a few disappointing statements and then some votes that people um, didn't agree with, along with people famously like Jamal Bowman. Um, as well. And I'm just curious, um, you know, how you would sort of respond to those kind of criticisms of, of, of their foreign policy in general when it comes to Israel-Palestine. I mean, I think uh, with Israel-Palestine, given what a charged issue is in the United States and given the massive amount of money that is sloshing around uh, mm -hmm. U.S. politics around that issue, specifically around, you know, basically keeping people on the pro-Israel line. Um, uh, it, it, it depends from squad member to squad member. AOC has definitely been wishy-washy on it. I mean, you know, you're right. She came up pretty strong. I remember hearing her very early kind of starting to walk some of that stuff back. Um, but, you know, you also have people like Ilan Omar and, and Rashida Tlaib, uh, who, you know, I mean, I, I take enormous amount of flack constantly. Uh, 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 I mean, I, I don't even know if I have to really go back through some of those examples, but I mean, like, they have been attacked Mm -hmm. relentlessly by, by of course, the right and Republicans, but but also by their own fellow Democrats over some of the positions that they've taken uh, on Israel and Palestine, positions that aren't even necessarily that, um, you know, 
particularly radical. Um, and but you know to give AOC her due as well. I mean, yes, definitely the the Iron Dome present vote was pathetic and embarrassing. But you know, I mean, also she has done things that that did uh, uh, involve some serious political risk. I mean, we have to remember that that this is in the in the context of the U.S. political system. Uh, you know, so saying things like Israel's an apartheid state, which she did, I think, as early as 2021, if not even earlier, um, as well as, you know, voting. I mean, the squad were the only people to vote against that resolution, um, uh, saying you know, the absurd resolution that Israel is neither an apartheid nor a racist state. <laughs> but the, the, the only uh, uh, sort of Western country in the entire world that, that, that has no problem with racism mm -hmm. and bridges. Um, but they were the only ones who took it. And I mean, you know, again, you can say that that's just symbolic and unimportant and so on. But then what confuses me is, well, is what's the Iron Dome uh, vote? I mean, that AOC's vote, present, yes, no, whatever way she did it, had no impact whatsoever on, on how it was going to go. It was purely about the principle. So, I mean, if you're going to take a... a, a that kind of stance um, on a symbolic vote and say, you know, it's, it's actually really important that she have the right position, then you at least have to take that same position on other symbolic actions where she actually does take the right position. Mm. You know, again, it's, it's just a matter of, of balance, I think. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, can I, to, just to get a bit meta a little bit like this, a lot of this seems to me, and I think like what Dave and maybe want to zero in at the end is like, maybe we should be a little bit more precious about the label socialist about this. But as far as like, I feel like a lot of this criticism come from people who are way too precious about voting. Like if you don't want to vote, fine. But like to the extent that like there's someone to vote for on election day, like these people are way better than uh, replacement level politicians um, goes. And like, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what you say to, to people who are like, well, you vote for anybody within this party constellation, you're supporting empire or you're supporting like finance capitalism. I mean, again, uh, talk to the people who are uh, working on, on campaigns or on the ground and, and, and trying to actually get things done. Uh, they, yeah. they don't see it that way. I mean, I'm sure they have criticisms, obviously, as we all do, of, of certain actions and, and, and things that they've said and things that they've done, of course. But uh, they see them as an asset. You know, I think uh, yeah. one of the, the, the people I spoke to, the Housing Justice for All uh, activists told me about, you know, I mean, look, uh, all politicians are kind of collaborate and organize with um, constituent groups. But, you know, in AOC's case, uh, you know, if Joe Crowley had, had kept winning, I mean, Joe Crowley uh, <laughs> happened to, to organize with landlords and homeowners and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. The difference is that, that AOC and people like her um, they the, the novel thing that they do is that they actually reach out to, to unions, to to low income people, to, to ordinary workers, to, to activists on the ground, and, and 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 try and see how they can be helpful to the, their struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think right. that's that's I, I think that idea that oh you vote for anyone in this power structure, it's 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 just vote for empire and capitalism. I think that's that's just kind of such a um, it's a very seductive. Uh, and kind of morally rigid way uh, to look at it, but it, it, it you know, it, it's completely divorced from the reality of, of people who are actually, you know, trying to um, uh, make change on the ground. Yeah, and I think that's what's important about your piece is like, you know, interviewing Sarah Nelson, the flight attendants union. Um, we also have, I mean, uh, defending rights and dissent, Chip Gibbons, we talk about, you know, him. And of yeah. course, you'd like them all to be more, um, uh, you know, uh, brave about this stuff, but like working with their offices to like talk about uh, you know, freedom of press and Assange, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or AOC going on a trip to Brazil and, you know, that sort of international like building, uh, political building is like, I think, you know, I like to see that. <laughs> No, for sure. You know, it, it, to me, it reminds me of that kind of discourse that was happening when Sanders was running. It was very much in the minority at the time when, when it looked like he actually, you know, had a good chance to win the presidency. Mm -hmm. And you would get people being like, well, look at look at what he's actually proposing. He's a social Democrat. You know, I mean, he's not proposing to uh, he's not running on nationalizing whole industries and so on and so forth. And I mean, I think all of us at the time, uh, understood that to be a, a, a ridiculous position. <laughs> um, and I, because look, this is a guy who actually had a, had a shot at, at taking the presidency and, and, and 
um, you know, maybe not going as far as we would like to in our dreams, but uh, uh, had, a, had a real chance to, to move things forward and, and, you know, leaps and bounds if he'd want it. Um, so the idea that, that, you know, he should run, now run as a kind of, you know, <laughs> socialist revolutionary and, and, and want, to, want to, you know, run basically on Castro's platform or something uh, yeah. was, was, of course, absurd. Um, and I think, you know, the difference, uh, part of the difference, I think, is that um, obviously he lost and I think that the incredible wave uh, of feeling of optimism and the, and the feeling that, that things were going somewhere really kind of um, dissipated in the wake of Santa's loss. And so now people have kind of gone back to these um, sort of ultra ultra leftist, ultra moralistic positions on things because they they believe that, you know, these the, the sort of compromises that the squad are making in terms of um, what kind of positions they take and what they're kind of willing to to, to take political risks on are not worth it because none of this is going anywhere and we have nothing to show for, you know, what, five years of them being in office. But again, I mean, objectively, I just don't think that's true. Um, I actually think there is a lot to show for it. Unfortunately, you know, we're talking about, what, six, uh, generously 10, if you want to add a few more people in there, 10 members mm -hmm. at most in a, in a, in a, house of 400 and something and i mean in, a, in, a, in an overall congress of 500 people um there, there's a obviously there are sadly stark limits to to what they'll be able to achieve but i think that you know it's not that it, that they've achieved nothing i think i think let's you know let's not fall into just complete pessimism and and, and, and demobilize so so you know i mean like you know just put my cars on the table a little bit it's like um, and I, I like I really liked your piece and I, I, you know, I shared it and we had you on because I, I, you know, I, I agreed with a lot of it because I think it is really important to be able to recognize who people are. What really frustrates me about that kind of black and white um, analysis that people do is like you're either like a radical socialist or you are like a class enemy is just not helpful. Right. It doesn't help you understand the constellation of power in American um, politics and it doesn't help us build better movements. And also, if you're not thinking about how mobilizing and motivating some of these figures can be for bringing people into the movement, you're making a big mistake. Bernie Sanders, you know, a great example, um, you know, that I think more people are hurt or more favorable of, right? Um, mm -hmm. Somebody who created a tremendous space for socialist movements, for the left, for projects like this, for projects like Jacobin. Um, now, where a lot of my frustration lies with the squad is like, you know, you'll look at something like uh, the railroad vote, right? And you can look at that and you can see how some people, even within the labor movement, are saying like, hey, they actually did what we asked them to do, right? Don't criticize them for that. Um, and that's all well and good, um, except that I think the role of, of a socialist politician should not just be pursuing only good progressive policy, but actually sort of moving politics in a certain direction. So if you have a kind of more conciliary aspect of the labor movement, which is saying like, you know, we're not super worried about this versus a more radical militant side of the labor movement, I think the role of a socialist politician in that situation should be to amplify um, the, the more radical militant side of it over the others, right? And for me, that betrayed uh, a way of thinking that wasn't particularly socialist, right? It was more liberal. Like, I've heard the people, I've, I, like, I've talked to the affected groups and I've listened to their concerns, right? Which is like a liberal kind of discourse way of thinking about politics. And when that happened, I found it to be a really demobilizing and demoralizing moment um, on the left. And, you know, so I say all that to say that, like, you know, there's a lot of frustrations I have um, with these folks. I don't think that right now that we have like the roster of the bench of like really class rooted socialist politicians, certainly in Congress or even that we're developing. And that's something that we have to be doing um, because I'll just go back to my classic line on AOC. It's like if you're really fixated on AOC, AOC or the rest of them, well, the problem is, is that all of our hopes and dreams are sort of here on this one person. So then their like personality and like the way they engage with politics really start to matter more than the movement, right? Because mm -hmm. like, oh, AOC just, if AOC wants to talk about sunscreen, right? Um, you know, this is a betrayal of the left, right? Well, you know, and any kind of rational, like, you know, mobilized, motivated, organized socialist left, I mean, it wouldn't matter if one figure did something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of how you feel about it. Um, so like, you know, I'm, 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 I am of, of two minds on this, where I don't think it's good to sort of say like, everything's dandy and we're good because we have some major media figures and some people elected to Congress who do good things sometimes and don't other times. 
Um, you know, I don't think that that's correct. But I also think it is just so demoralizing and demobilizing to this movement to to sort of treat all of these figures as traitors or as people who are working against us. Um, or, you know, or people who are really just symptoms, like all the frustrations that we have with them is symptoms of the fact that we're in a real, really tough, but important building stage of a real viable socialist movement in this mm -hmm. country. And AOC was like such a success, right? In the sense of like, no one thought she was going to be able to beat Joe Crowley. And like, now there's a kind of victim, like we're victims of our own success in the sense that like, before we had this movement, we were able to shoot up some major political figures into Congress. Mm -hmm. And now we sort of have to deal with that, uh, you know, tension between the organizations that supported them early on or the movement that might have and like the figures, because like they get calls from members of DSA, but they also get calls from NGOs and other groups that share a lot of our values, but maybe not all of our politics. Right. So anyways, like I, I know that was long winded, but like, I, you know, I just I'm curious, like if you have any responses to that, because, you know, it's 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 a difficult dance and it's not good for doing YouTube where you're supposed to be really <laughs> firm one way or the other. But that's just sort of where I'm at right now on that entire question. I'm curious if, if you have anything you'd like. To yeah, add. no, I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I, I think honestly, the the you can kind of split the, the, the camps, I guess, um, uh, of responses to this piece or even just this general kind of argument. In two, there's the people who would look at this stuff and go, oh, well, it's all been a waste of time. You know, well, let's forget about it and, and take our ball and go home. And then there's the other response, which is which is my response, which is to go, there's actually been some progress. Uh, it's not nearly far enough, of course. Um, and uh, it, it means that we should keep pushing further. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I've mentioned it in the piece very briefly, but I was at this uh, 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 conference about, this point two months ago or so, um, it was the I think first ever uh, uh, meeting of, of, of socialist um, elected officials around the country. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, at least in the last <laughs> I don't know, hundred years or so, uh, and uh, you know, it brought together about 50, um, 50 people around the country, elected mm -hmm. all over the place. You know, the south, the west, the mm -hmm. Midwest, Northeast. Um, and uh, a lot of these people, they were uh, sometimes the sole uh, people on their city councils or what have you. Sometimes they, they had some part of some of that. Sometimes they actually had blocks that they were able to really get stuff done with. But a lot of these people actually notched up some, some genuine accomplishments. I mean, it's small scale stuff, but it's, it, it, it's, it's not nothing. Um, and I mean, if you had said to... To, to anyone, uh, you know, what, uh, nine, 10 years ago that, you know, yeah. and, and sometimes there's going to be socialists and city councils all over the country, um, you know, passing ordinances to keep rent low and, you know, to, yeah. to, to speed up affordable ha uh, housing, um, they would say that's ridiculous. It's crazy. It's never going to happen. Um, and I think that to me, that, that means we have to just keep plowing ahead. And obviously that's going to require to, some self-reflection where, you know, there is failure and there have been failures, of course, I could go on for hours about mm -hmm. the failures that, that there have been. But, you know, I think sometimes excessively focusing on the failures, I think sometimes people think it's it's realism and I don't think it's realism. I think it's like a, it's a form of kind of its own self-deception. Uh, pessimism is not always kind of the the, um, the most accurate kind of way to, to view the world. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's very clear how misplaced pessimism could completely like make you miss something, right? Like, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to talk about it in the post game, but Robin Wansley, an independent socialist on the uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis City Council, uh, is spearheading the um, rent control fight and also the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, Uber Lyft driver uh, um, pay rise fight. And, you know, vetoed by uh, Mayor Jacob Fry both times, but we talk about this problem of wanting to differentiate the socialist movement from the neoliberal Democrat movement. Well, it's happening in Minnesota. You're not getting rent control. At least you have somebody there fighting for it and elaborating it, and then it gets to the executive and they kill it. But, uh, you know, that's better place than, like you say, like I figured we'd be in 
2013. Well, often, you know, I'll just add often that kind of stuff is not, it's not the end of, you know, a, a fight. It's often the beginning. I mean, I think right. people maybe have like a, a slightly, um, I don't know, romanticized view of, of, of how uh, these things get passed. I mean, you know, the road to, to success is often paid with just failure after failure after failure until it happens. Um, mm, right. You know, and, and, and just because that, that measure was vetoed does not mean that's the end of it, you know. So uh, and I, I would say the same thing for, for many, um, many such similar fights. Well, uh, brother, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, the piece in Jacobin uh, by uh, Bronco is AOC and the squad's list of left-wing accomplishments is quite long, but just a couple other pieces that you've put out since uh, that that I think are really good. U.S. presidents keep bungling disaster responses and a really great piece um, on something that I wish we have covered more on Left Reckoning. I always regret that we can't get into everything. Um, Imran Khan's ouster is a story of U.S. power and propaganda. Uh, Bronco is definitely somebody you should be reading if you aren't already. Um, appreciate your time so much, brother, and looking forward to reading your stuff, your next uh, uh, bit of stuff. Cheers, man. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thanks, Bronco. Thanks, guys. Yeah, you forgot to even mention the uh, piece on the self-driving cars taking over uh, <laughs> San Francisco that we're going to heavily crib in the post game. Yeah, we are, well, we're going to borrow from his piece <laughs> as we usually do on this program. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, I'm really like, I mean, I like Jacobin Magazine across the board, but uh, Bronco is somebody um, who, you know, I'm always interested to, to see what he does because, you know, he does something and now that he's not hidden behind the scenes because i don't want to embarrass him one thing i always say about his writing that i really appreciate is that he is a very committed anti-imperialist and socialist but he's also somebody who like engages with like the media and the debates and the things that are happening like in the new york times and like whatever the kind of mainstream american political conversation is yeah so he's able to report on things and write about things that like I, my first reaction would be like oh this is a boring like new york times like subject right i don't want to get really fixated on this right this doesn't feel like a place for social agitation and he finds a way to sort of do it and make a case for a different world right where maybe we have more political power so if you aren't already reading his stuff like he really is somebody i can't um, suggest enough yeah i mean those staff writer positions you know we react to stuff on a fairly like um immediate uh pace it's yeah. different in writing <laughs> and uh and to be able to do that um, and come up with like very, um, you know, I mean, this is a this is a compliment Bronco, but to well put um, arguments that are, you know, ideologically sound um, is, I think, very impressive to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm extremely impressed. So, who, I mean, is there anything else we want to, to say on that? I mean, like for folks who watch the Griscom streams, no. Pretty much every week, this is what we talk about, right? Because somebody always <laughs> asks me about AOC, and I, you know, honestly, like I don't. I, I would say that I get bored of it. Um, I get bored of it when it's like the controversy of like, oh my god, AOC did a sunscreen discourse this week, right? Um, like that's boring to me. But like, no, I think that y'all should, like, the listeners, we should, the movement should, be thinking about how we engage with our politicians. But more importantly than that, thinking about what kind of movement it is that we're trying to build. Um, you know, there's a section of, of the left that have gone really hard in sort of boosting, um, you know, things like third party voting. And like it's something that's something that I'd like support um, in the general sense, like people's right to do it. Um, but with the goal of there being like a socialist movement party that is the beneficiary of that. Yeah, not just um, a counter establishment party. And I think that that's a really important distinction because. Yeah. You know, I think that, uh, like, even though it might be preferable on some level, I don't think like a counter establishment party, as you put it, Matt, um, is what we need right now. I think we need a very well rooted working class movement, um, you know, a socialist party of, of some sort or another. Um, you know, so I support those, those kind of things generally. And I, I say all that to say that, like, you know, we're in a difficult moment right now. We have to think about what it is that we need to do. Um, but to be able to get there, we really need to understand where we are at. And what frustrates me with a lot of left criticism is not that they criticize these people. We do that all the time on this program. Uh, Bronco does it too. 
Um, but that it's not sort of driven in a way of like, what would a, what would a stronger working class uh, politician look like? What would somebody who's really rooted in the socialist movement look like? It's just kind of general frustrations with the fact that we all share this frustration, by the way, that like we aren't in charge of these people, right? Because our groups aren't the ones that are in power. Um, these right. are people who might listen to us, who might affiliate with us, um, but it's not a direct line. And that's a tough thing um, to deal with, but you can deal with it in the sense of like, okay, how do we build that? Or you can sort of deal with it in like, oh, these people have bad hearts or their soul is corrupted, right? And I don't think that that's very analytical, frankly. Right. Um, and you know, I, I can't come at it. I mean, we're going to have actually an author to talk about the North Dakota nonpartisan league, but I go on and on about it because they went through precisely this dialectic, which is that, okay, shit, we'd been, we'd been trying our third party stuff and we just get washed out. Mm. But it looks like, look at the circumstances, especially in North Dakota, but in some other states where they had open primaries, well, run, in, run on whichever. And it, yeah. down the line, it leads to an issue where, oh, crap, neither of the parties has – you don't have control of enough of one of the parties to, like, do anything once that party gets into power. So there's, there's um, you know, there's not only upside in doing that nonpartisan um, strategy, but, like, it, they dealt with it and they, like – whether the tr um, contradictions um, led to it not becoming, you know, another Bolshevik movement on the upper plains, but instead like, you know, a state uh, grain elevator, a state uh, flour mill and a state bank, you know, that's something. And it's, and it is them addressing the same sort of conflict uh, and issue that we are dealing with today with regards to electoral system. And they decided like, we need to be like, uh, I mean, I don't want to get too much into that, but like, look, oh, yeah. this has been, this is, this is a, this is a thing that has been dealt with before. And then I, I just, I like that piece. Cause so many people like, I mean, door door was, yeah. is the caricature of this, but to say like young climate activists are supporting imperialism because they think the Democrats might be more, uh, you know, fertile ground for like to agitate on climate. Like, that's just, what are we doing at this point? Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of the stuff is bad. And look, it's uh, it's easier sometimes to talk in black and white. But, you know, if you really want to look at these things analytically or in a Marxist lens, like you have to spend a little bit more time on it. And like, I think we might want to get some some more different folks. I'm thinking about um, getting a little bit more pugnacious on this program with some of our guests. We might get some people who we might fundamentally disagree with, but come from a place of um, you know, reasoned reason instead of just sort of chasing controversy. Um, but anyways, table that we'll do more of that in, in the near future. Um, we're going to go to the post game in just a minute. Patreon.com slash left reckoning to get that. we got a lot of fun stuff. We're going to be talking about everyone's favorite thing, which is how stupid those dumbass car uh, self-driving cars are. Um, and much, much more taking phone calls and questions. Patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that. But before we get there, we got to talk about something big. We've been covering this for a while now, um, which has been the Teamsters fight with UPS for a better contract. Um, it has been a tenacious one. It has been one um, that has has taken a lot of commitment from people and have been very inspired by a lot of left organizations like DSA, for example, for really engaging in a non in, in a way um, that is direct, but is also not trying to overshadow or overstep the union movement, saying. How can we help you? How can we support you? That's been incredible organization, um, or, you know, things that the left has been doing there, because not only are you helping people today, but you're also creating that connection and that commitment and that rootedness. That's good. 86% of uh, Teamsters voted um, to ratify this historic contract. Um, and let's just go to the press. This is today. This is breaking news, like three o'clock this afternoon. Yep. Uh, this came out. So if you haven't heard it yet, this is the news here. Um, Teamsters ratify historic UPS contract. And we'll just read the press release from uh, Teamsters. Five year national agreement passes overwhelmingly one supplement to be renegotiated. Today, Teamsters voted by an overwhelming 86.3% to ratify the most historic uh, collective bargaining agreement in the history of UPS. The five year contract protects and rewards more than 340,000 Teamsters nationwide, raising wages for full-time and part-time workers, uh, creating more full-time jobs and securing important workplace protections, including air conditioning. Uh, the agreement passed by the highest vote for a contract in the history of the Teamsters at UPS. 
Um, so this is something uh, to celebrate, to be happy about, um, without a doubt. And I know we have some video um, stuff if we wanted to start with that. I know there's some lessons here and how do we get here that we might want to get into in a second. Um, but if we want to start with video, we can do that first. Yeah, I mean, this isn't uh, directly related to this vote, but I mean, just a, a, a nice, uh, I think, show of solidarity here. Uh, SEIU is uh, on the picket line at Garfield Medical Center in uh, Los Angeles. I think it might be San Bernardino. I don't, don't quote me on that, um, but in the L.A. area. And uh, here we have a Teamster uh, not crossing the picket line uh, to deliver packages. Uh, and uh, I, I'm a sucker for this sort of and, and, you know, it's the um, pausing for us, but you get the point. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just to go into that um, real quickly before we get back to the Teamsters stuff, but that those uh, nurses are striking because, surprise, there's staffing shortages uh, that aren't being dealt with. And uh, the, the uh, hospital's like, well, we only started hearing about staffing shortages like around the time you wanted a new contract. Well, it's like, it turns out like maybe you can't pay people enough to overlook the fact that they are like uh, understaffed to the point of a nurse taking on two to three times the workload a single nurse should be like it's it's horrible that this is still a conversation we're having that mm -hmm. these places and like there, there's one quote from, from the union that said like well we haven't been penalized by the state of california for this it's like that you should not have to wait until the state comes down and says you need to staff this stuff in a way that isn't dangerous for for you to give in to this uh, demand. So anyway, um, but that's just nice to see that uh, Teamster Sky uh, you know, not cross the line. And this is an important point um, because, as as we've said time and time again, that like the this contract for the Teamsters is helpful for the labor movement as a whole. It's helpful for the UAW as it makes these uh, moves. It's helpful uh, for that scenario that you just laid out. It's helpful for the entire the entirety of the union movement. And like, how does this happen, right? Because for people who haven't been paying attention to the labor movement over the past few decades, a lot of these contracts have been contracts of concessions. They have been contracts where you were getting less or you were trying to defend what you have. Very rarely are these expanding, uh, particularly when it comes to inflation or the profits that these companies um, are, are making, right? This was a contract that got a lot for workers, not just on wages, but also on working conditions. Um, and how does it happen? One, undeniably, it happens because of rank and file organizing within the Teamsters that said, we want this union to reflect the wills and the desires of the membership more than it has in the past. And that goes into a tremendous amount that, that meant a lot of organizing from people who are already organized, already members of a union and trying to change the way that this union, union operates and functions. Um, and then uh, electing this kind of reform slate. Um, that was able to do this kind of negotiation that was willing to fight more for workers. And by making a very clear and credible threat to UPS, one of the most profitable com uh, companies in the country, that a strike is a very real possibility. This is just a piece. If you are in a union, this is a great piece to read. Um, it's from Labor Notes today. Uh, so you want to practice picket. Here's how we did it um, by Dane Roll. Um, you can read it on the labor notes, all of the, the specific um, kind of tips um, that, that, that they lay out here. Um, but why is this practice picket so important? Because this is what put the fear of God into UPS. So for people who weren't following this might not be familiar, um, the, you know, the Teamsters did not go on strike, but they were doing these kind of practice pickets. As you saw there in the photograph, they were showing up before around the shifts um that they had so they weren't on strike so people were still going in and working their shifts but people were out there holding signs they weren't stopping people from going to work because again they weren't on strike but they were bodies out on the street saying we are ready we are organized and we we're so committed that we're just gonna practice we're gonna start doing it early that helped ups realize that this was a credible threat from the teamsters and there is just no doubt about it that this contract is not as strong if they didn't engage in this tactic so this mm -hmm. comes so yes you know there's parts of the left that sort of just want to see a strike because of how galvanizing it is right i can understand that from like a you know like trying to promote militancy in general but you also have to remember that this is a question of people's lives and their livelihoods 
right? So you can't ask people to make that that commitment, um, you know, just willy nilly. And this was a way to be able to organize, build that connection, build that camaraderie, and show working class power. This is something that was really galvanizing for membership within the Teamsters, and it was something that was extremely effective as a negotiating tactic uh, from the Teamsters. Um, so there are two major things that happened here that were that allowed them to be successful was one, this push for more democratization of the union, um, and two, this willingness to be militant and start doing these kind of practice pickets um, to show that the threat is credible. It's very interesting, all the people that I'm looking at the um, more perfect union uh, quote tweet of AOC on the practice picket line. And all the people who are like, use that as a reactionary sort of foothold to be like, practice picket? What's the point of that? You need to practice to picket? It's just so it really wrong. kind of illustrates what we're talking about with Bronco. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, again, you know, um, that's... <laughs> that's like a general pessimism and some morbid symptoms for people on the left. Like you should be able to show um, solidarity. Uh, let me just show you like why this did matter, right? This is a quote from the piece. Um, the best part of our, con what is practice picketing? The best part of our contract campaign at UPS was practice picketing. We had never done anything like it at our building in Bloomington, Indiana, and I was amazed at how well it went. Nearly everyone on my shift showed up and felt energized after. It not only put pressure on the company, but it also brought us together. Quote, doing practice picketing was so cool yesterday. One of my mm -hmm. coworkers told me the next day, I actually felt like I was a part of something bigger for the first time at my job, right? I mean, so, so yeah, it does fucking matter, assholes who are getting like worked up and trying to like discredit all of these fucking working people. Like, if you sit here and you want to say that you speak for working people or whatever, and you're hammer and sickle to in engage your... with this kind of shit, you're not yeah. signaling to workers, you're signaling to your friends and all of these kind of cynical people. No, this was yeah. a good thing that built camaraderie and solidarity within the union movement let people see the power that they have it is good shit yeah absolutely um well we do have uh, we're gonna uh give the uh, f uh free watchers here a little taste of the conversation we had with the minion death cult boys uh alex and tony uh very funny show um but yeah. also done really i think responsible uh coverage of this um and talking about uh, Alex talked about his no vote, which is like obviously this is a great contract. What we've been saying, but he's he elaborates it himself. Uh, which yeah, and our, I mean, and his position made perfect sense to me, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, and uh, then we'll be in the post game, folks. So, so uh, for people who might not be familiar, by the way, this is from yes. a bonus up from the bonus episode last week. So you get access to that patreoncom slash left reckoning. But we're just going to play a couple minutes here for folks as a little taste. Yeah, this is the tail end. We did get into uh, the primary uh, in an in amusing way before this, but this is just the end here where we talk about the uh, Teamsters vote. And then are we coming back or? Um... I think we'll go straight to. Uh, All right. So, we're, so we're going to play this, folks. We're going to the post game, patreon.com slash left reckoning. We'll be there about 10, 15 minutes after the, the show ends. Uh, so come join us there. Ask us some questions. I'm sure people have a lot of thoughts about our conversation with Bronco and uh, the, this Teamsters contract. So get those in. Yeah. Um, in the final uh, uh, section of this interview, uh, Alex, you are also, in addition to a podcast host, a Teamster for UPS. And you guys mm -hmm. have been doing great work um, discussing both uh, the part-time, uh, full-time dynamics here, but also... Uh, related to the mission of your show, uh, the way sort of this these union politics uh, intersects with our culture, uh, uh, sort of um, partisan politics uh, between GOP and Democrat, for instance. Um, I'm just curious. So before we get into that, though, um, tell people about how you're voting. I believe the final day of voting is Tuesday, uh, the 22nd. Uh, is that correct? Um, yeah. To walk people through your vote, uh, no vote before we get into some of the more um, uh, other ways people are voting no. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a really complicated. I have really complicated emotions about this contract. Um, this for people who aren't as following as closely. Our our current president is a reform 
president of the Teamsters. He's sort of like the protest candidate who ran against J uh, Jimmy Hoffa Jr.'s selected uh, candidate. Jimmy Hoffa Jr. was our previous president who forced through uh, bad contract after bad contract that membership opposed, but we, due to uh, bylaws in our constitution, they were able to override our, our votes. Uh, we got that part of the constitution amended last year, uh, two years ago. And so we, uh, yeah, our, our, there's, there's a current strong wave of like militancy within the union that pushed us to this leadership team and also did get us, I mean, uh, the best contract we, you know, I've been a UPS teamster for 17 years and this is by far the best contract I've seen. Um, it's also really, uh, it, extremely the best contract I've seen for part timers who are who make up 60% of UPS's labor force. People don't realize that they see the memes about the well paid drivers or whatever. 60% of, of UPS employees are like are making around like 15 bucks an hour and they're loading all the trucks, they're unloading the trucks, they're sorting the packages. Like every UPS package you get is touched by, you know, probably five to 10 part time employees, whereas the one full time driver brings it to you. So um, this contract gives a big bump to those part-time employees. Um, it's not quite what we were fighting for, which was we wanted $25 an hour for part-time employees. And this contract gets them up to 21 in the first year and then to about 25 at the end of this five-year contract, which is which is good, but it's, you know, with inflation and all that, really not enough. Um so I I am going you know there's there's other things as well but um there's a lot of really good stuff in this contract we got rid of our two tier driving system uh which if people aren't familiar with that phrase it's a way of creating a second category of a very similar job operation that makes less wages and of course it's an incentive for the company to hire more of those you know lower paid uh, employees as opposed to like, you know, a good career, which I have because I'm, because I've been full time at UPS, you know, it took me a while to get here, but once, once you get to full time, uh, it, it is a really good career. I have a pension, I have benefits. I, you know, I was able to buy a house a couple of years ago. Um, and we want to, we want to secure that for future employees. And so we were able to get rid of that lower paid tier driving job. Uh, but I, I still think we need to get part-time pay up just to retain employees. Um, UPS was voluntarily raising wages for part-timers just to keep them, like paying them more than what the contract said, just so we could have people to load our trucks in the morning. And um, I'm not sure that 21 an hour solves that, but I'm also not sure if there's the fight within the union to push farther than this really good contract. Um, so you, you see some, you know, vote no campaigns being organized, especially by part timers. And I really respect that. That's the only way to go forward is for, uh, part time teamsters to organize themselves and, and to be able to form like a block that can successfully influence leadership and give them direction. Uh, because a no vote, you vote down a contract. Well, that doesn't mean that the next contract is going to have what you want in it. You still have to be able to uh, communicate and influence those wishes of the broader uh, rank and file membership. Uh, so it's very curious. It's, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. I'll be voting no to see if that energy is there to push farther. Um, and yeah, I'm eager to see how it turns out. Yeah, and I'd just recommend uh, your guys' episode um, on July 21st uh, with Alex interviewing uh, US, UPS part-timers. Um, and uh, also, you know, we don't, I don't want to, I want people to uh, become patrons and, uh, and listen to your most recent episode. I voted no today because I am a man, but just broadly speaking, <laughs> um, I'm fascinated by this sort of like, because we talk theoretically on this show about, you know, what the union movement, uh, revitalized union movement could do for our um, cursed politics uh, in this country. And, mm -hmm. but you actually are witnessing it sort of actually happening in front of your eyes i'm just curious what observations you have about that uh yeah i mean it's it's spectacular because you know like we said on that episode um the election derangement is so intense that you just if 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 a vote 
is happening anywhere for whatever reason, like mm -hmm. there are people going to be calling it fake or the rigged <laughs> or whatever, you know what I mean? Because, because of that. And it's like, it's so funny that in what is the most democratic process, like almost anyone sees in America, and it's still a small percentage of people who are in unions to see this democratic process, but we have like a direct a borderline direct democracy within the union and to see people still freak out about rigged elections or about you know the the elites uh turning you know turning levers and and things like that is very funny um but it's also funny to see people who do have this desire for a showdown with the company for a confrontation with capital they wouldn't call it capital they would call it the boss or the ceo or whatever they they want this fight and they feel this fight is like the morally righteous and logically correct thing to do but the only language they have to describe that is a meme of dylan mulvaney saying i'm voting yes on the contract <laughs> because because I love the CEO Carol Tomei or whatever, so it's it's fascinating because it's like you're doing the right thing in a in the most bizarre way I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, go ahead, Tony. Well, yeah, it's, like, it's that whole thing where it's like I, I'm I'm happy that they're 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 making the decision. It's just unfortunate what got them there. You know, it's yeah. just unfortunate what got them there. And yeah, that that whole brain poisoning of just the distrust of. Um, electoral politics has just bled its way over into everything else to where uh, it's almost like they need to find a new term that's not vote. You know, it's almost <laughs> like, you know, uh, maybe just take a poll or just anything else, you know, because like they're, they're going to, they're convinced that right now, like Ale Alexander is going to uh, show everybody um, the QR code and we're all going to vote um to corrupt it you know like that that's what right. i think is going to happen it's like it's not but that they're just so scared of it it's so it's so funny to watch because it it is this is the one time where they do have the vote that will directly affect right. their life right mm -hmm. it's like an actual important vote and it's so yeah. and to be like so deranged and like stirring yourself up into a fervor you're like undermining an actual democratic power you have yeah yeah. Like if you, you voting, you have to be really rich if you think that whoever you're going to vote for for president is going to make you more money. But mm -hmm. this is the one time where your vote will make you more money if that's the only way you want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can't recommend the episode enough. Um, you guys get into the uh, the ways that certain guys are trying to voter fraud this thing <laughs> to prove a point in a way that's not exactly productive. But again, like I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, reveal too much of it. Um, Tony and Alexander, thank you guys so much. Uh, minion Death Cult, Patreon dot com slash uh, Minion Death Cult. Um, oh, give your Twitter ads or uh, you know Blue Sky ads if you want to uh, get off Twitter. But uh, yeah, where should people follow you guys? Uh, at Minion Death Cult and at Flieldy, F L I E L D Y. It's a portmanteau of the two coolest bass players in the world. Yeah. yeah. And I'm uh, at Word is Bond or Word. I, that's uh, at word is bond uh, for Tony there. I <laughs> I thought I could load up the uh, outro um, before that got out there. So I apologize. At word is bond. Go give uh, uh, Tony a follow there. And uh, that was the final seconds of that interview there. So uh, if David wants to come on as a uh, sign out um, or if he just wants me to do it, folks, we will see you in the post game in about uh, 15 minutes or so. So patreon.com slash left reckoning we will see you then